I pray to everyone as well on today. Again, this is Pastor Hag with the First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. This is our Sunday school hour uh, here at First Mount Zion. Give me, forgive me for starting late on this morning. Uh, we had an awesome day yesterday in our Mother's Day cookout. Uh, the pastor cooked. Um, I was cooking and um, I felt it this morning. <laughs> so I was a little sore this morning uh, getting up, but nothing that uh, a little heat therapy and um, a little bit of ibuprofen uh, couldn't take care of. Just thank God for being able to get here on today. Uh, we're not going to negate the Sunday school lesson. Uh, uh, today is called Freedom for the Future. And I know you see the subheading there. Um, I forgot to correct that, and I'll correct that uh, soon enough. Um, uh, after the fact, just to edit it and so forth. But it's freedom for the future. Freedom for the future. And let's have a word of prayer uh, so we can get right to our lesson today. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, honor you, praise you, glorify you on this Mother's Day. Thank you, Lord, for all the mothers, oh God, that have uh, risked so much, oh God, and given so much in order to take care of children. Uh, sometimes not even their own biological children, oh God, but to give advice as well as to make sure there is nurture, um, the aspect of being nurtured and, um, and cared for, God, and loved. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord, for the celebration today on, on Mother's Day. And God, we thank you, Lord, for all that you are, will do in this lesson on today, the Sunday School lesson. We ask right now that you bless us, that you allow us to see your glory as we continue to move forward, oh God, in your name. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with that being said, we'll get right into the lesson on today. Uh, again, Freedom for the Future, Romans chapter 8. Verses 18 through 30, that's where we're going to be on this morning. And we just thank God for just being here and being in the midst of where uh, we are on today. Our aim for change reads this way. It says, by the end of this lesson, we will understand the role of the Holy Spirit in our relationships with God and Jesus. Uh, feel empowered by the Holy Spirit, even in the midst of suffering, weakness, or loss of direction. And live with hope as we seek God's purpose and calling. And the end focus reads this way. It says, Thomas would always arrive 20 minutes late for work. His attitude was, I can always stay late and finish what I need to do. He would lie and tell his boss he had car trouble. The truth of the matter was Thomas had trouble getting out of bed in the morning. The thought of facing the multitude of tasks on his, uh, his to-do list gave him real mental stress. So much that he delayed going to bed and tossed and turned through the night, making his morning alarm even harder to obey. He was even considering talking to his doctor about the problem. In the meantime, he felt he felt 20 minutes should not matter as long as he got his work done before he left the office. One day in the cafeteria, he overheard a co-worker telling someone how his lateness hinders others in the office from meeting their deadlines because they are waiting on him to do his part. Thomas realized his actions had a negative impact on those who depended on him. His behavior had to change, but he didn't think he had the strength. That night, he forced himself into bed a full eight hours before his morning alarm. He didn't have an, an entire plan, didn't even know what the root of the problem was. He just knew he should pray about it. God would understand what he meant. God would grant him the miracle he needed. And it says here, God helps us in our struggles to do what is right and empowers us to overcome sin through our faith in Jesus Christ. How has the Spirit helped you to pray uh, to pray, and help you in your struggles? And I, I believe that faith in and of itself, what it does, it begins a, a tie-in for us of uh, truly the belief that we have in Christ and realize in a realization that there is substantive power in regards to the belief that we have in Christ. Now, what, I, what am I saying in regards to that? I know it sounds very basic, okay? It sounds very basic. They, okay, the tenets of faith, Sean, substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen, understood. However, the reality is, is that if you're not praying in faith, then what is the foundational strength upon which you're leaning on when you pray? And I believe this is something that we always have to keep in mind from the perspective of when we go through the aspect of the words of prayer. Um, it's one thing, again, to say, uh, can you pray for me? Or ask someone to pray for you. But the question is, are you just only asking for prayer because of the, recip uh, the uh, re receipt 
of what you think a blessing should be and you're going to forget about it? Or do you think there's some level of task, if you will, that maybe God is trying to really usher into our own spirit in order to make us better, in order to improve us, in order to get us to a place spiritually where when we pray to God, yes, we're asking and we put our petition before God because God has asked us to do that. But at the same time, the question becomes, what, what am I gaining? And I'm putting that in quotes. What am I gaining in my relationship with God that is going to challenge me to be better than I was yesterday? And I think this is something that we oftentimes have to really think about for ourselves because a lot of times uh, we don't want to be challenged. I, 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 will, I will say this. Uh, a mentor told me years ago, he said, we, we, are, we are called as pastors and preachers in order to inconvenience the people. And guess what? The people don't want to be inconvenienced. That's the reality. No one wants to be taken out of their comfort zone. However, the word of God does it often. It does it repeatedly. It does it in perpetuity. And the reason why it does that is because we can all improve in some area of our lives that God is trying to make manifest. And in that, there's no freedom to the future until we're able to change that. Until we're able to allow ourselves to obey God, to see what Reproof God is trying to place in correction. He's trying to place in our lives. Identify that, put it before God, and begin working towards improvement towards it. And this is why it's so challenging a lot of times that we can get so caught up in the conundrum of, of sometimes traditions and things of that nature that we miss we miss the mark. We miss the full scope of what it is that God is trying to do. God says, put your petition before God, but if you're just being blessed because of a prayer that was given and then God, you receive an answer from God and you forget about it, then is, is that the full intent of what, of what the prayer was or, or your contact and connection with God? There's always an exchange. And if we're not being challenged by God to be better, to do better, uh, according to his word, not our own righteousness, but according to his word, then we, we, need, we need to really think about and really kind of question that. Because I think that when we are honest with ourselves, we'll begin to realize that there are aspects of our lives that need improvement. That goes from every aspect of the church, from pulpit to pew, from preacher to uh, con congregate sitting in, the, um, sitting in the pew. If we're honest with ourselves, we will begin the process of being, again, being honest, even in our prayer life. So our prayers won't be, Lord, I need. That It won't begin that way. It, it will begin, Lord, first, thank you. And that next, Lord, forgive me. <laughs> because I, I, I realize I'm not perfect. And I realize there are areas of my, my own life, Lord, that you are still improving. Remember, none of us are perfect. But I told you, no one wants to be inconvenienced either. Because folks sometimes will feel that, well, the place where I am, it's, it's all right. It's okay. And until you're ready to begin challenging that, I honestly believe you won't, full, you won't really receive the full expectancy of what God really has for you because you're unwilling to let some of the things that are gripping you and are causing vices in, or vices in your life, you're not allowing those to be released. You're not allowing those to be released before God and being honest in regards to it. Because God already knows. So there's a freedom that comes with that. And I believe that you really can't step into really the auspices of the next things in the future that God has for you until you're ready to begin releasing these things to God and trusting God that God, there's some things that aren't right. And I need some rectification in that regard. Any questions or comments in that before we even get into the scripture? Because this begins a process and a dialogue that to me, many Christians don't want to talk about. They don't want to discuss. They don't want to get into because it's it's too uh, it's too much. It's it's well, you know, I really want to put myself out on the street, you know, like that. Well, no one's asking you to. That's between you and God. But if you're not honest with yourself in those things that you need improvement on, God is waiting because He already knows. But when we're honest with God in regards to those things, God will begin to answer our prayers in and to me, in ways that we couldn't even imagine and bring us into a higher plane in relationship with himself as well as with mankind. Okay? 
So this is why, I, I don't know why this is, this, the lesson is called Freedom for the Future, but when we look at the passage, hopefully this will bring a lot of this out from that perspective. Again, that question was, how has the Spirit helped you to pray and helped you in your struggles? And so, again, it's the faith, okay, the faith of God and the Spirit of God that does that. In, in, in order to have the interaction with God, uh, with God through the Holy Spirit, to begin to place those things in that, uh, uh, out front in order to gain more spiritual freedom as we continue to proceed in this journey of life. Okay? Um, our keep in mind scripture this morning is Romans chapter 8, verse 18, which says, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal for us later. One of my, my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Again, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Again, Romans 8 and 18. That's the uh, signature verse. Keep in mind scripture for today. So before we get into our text, let's get into a little background this morning. It's going to kind of help us kind of set the lesson up. The suffering of the righteous. That's the sub, uh, subheading in our, in our text. And it says the Bible provides numerous examples of godly people who experienced a significant amount of suffering for various reasons. Joseph, David, uh, Job, Jeremiah, and Paul, to name a few. Historically, many of, many of African descent suffered for the sake of the gospel. The Bible gives various reasons believers suffer, including an ongoing consequence of the fall, being the fall of man. That's why sin entered into the world mean the sin of Adam. When sin entered the world, pain, sorrow, conflict, and eventual death invaded the lives of human beings, Genesis 3, 16 through 19. In fact, the entire created universe groans under the effects of sin and yearns for the time of the new heaven and new earth when God will abolish the curse, Romans 8, 20 through 23, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. The same reason that unbelievers suffer uh, as a consequence for their act, their own actions, Galatians 6 and 7. Three, because we live in a sinful and corrupt world, all around us are effect, effects of sin, and we experience distress and anguish as we see the power that evil holds over so many people's lives, Ezekiel 9 and 4, Acts 17 and 16. And number four, the, the devil has been given power to afflict us in a variety of ways. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9. The story of Job is an example of this kind of suffering. Job chapter 1 and 2. Now the background for today. In Romans 7, Paul writes about the grace of Christ. He shows us that without grace, a believer would live a defeated and miserable life in bondage to their sinful nature. However, in Romans 8, Paul changes his focus and begins sharing about the supernatural life that has been made available to all believers of Jesus Christ. Through, through our union with Christ by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, believers are now able to live a life free from condemnation, and they no longer have to be enslaved by sin. The Spirit gives believers victory over sin and allows them to experience true fellowship with God. Paul lets us know that the only way we can uh, be delivered from the power of sin is by receiving and being controlled by the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit working in the life of a believer will lead them to victory. The Apostle affirms there are two kinds of people, those who live according to the flesh and those who live according to the Spirit. People who choose to live after the flesh take pleasure in the corrupt desires of sinful human nature including fornication, adultery, strife, and uncleanliness, uh, uncleanness, Galatians 5, 19 through, uh, 19 through 21. Those who live by the Holy Spirit will submit to his leading and exhibit love, peace, goodness, and self-control, Gal uh, Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Every true believer receives the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit the moment they accept Jesus Christ. Thus, it is only through the spirit that we are able to put to death the deeds of the body, Romans 8 and 13. The mark of a true believer is the ability to be led by the spirit. Paul also reminds us 
that living in the spirit and being victorious are not always easy. We are to prepare ourselves through the spirit to suffer even as Jesus suffered. We identify with Christ through our suffering with him that we may be also glorified together. And the question here says, if we have been glorified with Christ, why must the Christian still suffer? And I'm going to pose that to y'all. Let me read the question again. If we have been glorified with Christ, why must the Christian still suffer? Anybody? No one. No one's going to be brave to step on out there today. That's all right. It's Mother's Day. I'm going to give y'all a pass. <laughs> now, let, 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 let's talk about that question a little bit. Okay? If we have been glorified with Christ, why must the Christian still suffer? Christ's glory, the glory of Christ, is rooted in suffering. Let me say that again. The glory of Christ is rooted in suffering. The reason why I say that is because, one, we can look at the ministry of Christ and we see that even through all of the work, the good works that Christ did, there was always some level of suffering and persecution that he had to face ultimately leading him to the greatest persecution of the cross. And it's amazing here is that the glorification that comes by way of Christ will come by way of some level of suffering. Okay? Christians will suffer. No one wants to talk about that. There's so many preachers that don't talk about it. And it's amazing to me that they don't because the Bible is laced with it that we are going to experience troubles of every kind. Paul talks about it honestly and earnestly. I believe, believe so because of his adventures, I say adventures, missionary journeys in the book of Acts. He, when he was converted in Acts chapter 9, they tried to stone him. In, um, I, I, I forgot, that was on the first missionary journey, but I'm trying to remember where it was. Even Derby, uh, uh, Derby or Lystra or one of those places. They threw stones and tried to kill him and thought they killed him. Thought they killed Paul, but they didn't. And he ended, he ended up escaping and, and, um, and, and going through the other parts of the missionary journey. But it's amazing how those who are promoting the good of God and the good of Christ will face persecution because there is a difference between those who live in the flesh versus those who live in the spirit. So glory in Christ has suffering tied to it. And again, no one wishes to talk about it, but it's a reality. Now, does that mean that, you know, that we, that we exchange, you know, exchange uh, violence for violence? No, not at all, because it's not Christ. Or any level of persecution, someone named me out, I name them out. No, that's not the way of Christ. And this is why the glory of God is revealed because the hope that is built in God and that's built in Christ is much bigger than any level of persecution that we should face. Now, oftentimes we refer back to the civil rights movement. I always do. Because to me, it is a clear example of how the love of Jesus Christ is exemplified, is exemplified by way of persecution. All folks are wanting is equal rights being able to vote, being able to have equities in life. But if someone thinks that they or certain groups shouldn't have those, now here comes the persecution. We don't want you to have it. Well, why don't you wish to have it? Every human should have, should have these rights if we live in this country. No, we don't think you should. Well, why? So, so is there, there, there's a level or a backing of your flesh that predetermines for, predetermines for you why I shouldn't receive those same rights. And you yourself call yourself a Christian. But you're saying I should be substandard. That isn't of, of Christ. That isn't of the, the word of God. And this is why I'll, you have to be very careful 
when you hear that word Christian thrown, thrown around, because you got to try the spirit by the spirit. And, and that's one of the things that we, we must encounter as we live our lives is that, okay, is this thing really of God? Because if it is, then you're going to see some combativeness from another side that's going to come up against it. Openly. I'm sorry, go, go ahead, Dean Kenny. spiritual beings living in these fleshly bodies but at the same time we have been given instruction on how to fight or how to defend ourselves spiritually uh, Ephesians tells us to put on the whole the armor, armor of God, God. right mm -hmm. you know therefore so we are <clears throat> going to suffer regardless of how good we may be or may not be we are going to suffer spiritually, you know, with the devil coming at us with all these, you know, darts and everything and temptations. You know, we're always going to suffer. We need to be prepared to fight or defend ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, in that suffering. So, so there, there's, there's kind of two things I kind of hear you saying when what you said it and, and I, it's what came to mind. So you have an internal battle that you're dealing with spiritually. So you're dealing with an internal battle because you're already laced in flesh. Because we're in flesh, we have a propensity to sin. Before you got here, you sinned this morning. In some way, you probably sinned this morning. You may not have known it, you may have known it. But the reality is, because we're in the flesh, we always have a propensity to sin. It doesn't mean that we're captive to sin. But we hold sin captive because of our belief and faith of Christ. That's where the freedom comes in. Okay? And the reason why I say this is because we have to always acknowledge the aspect of our, our limitations. Okay? In, in, in the human wrap-up that we have. So we will always have these battles with Satan spiritually. There will always be spiritual warfare this day. However, you cannot ever count yourself defeated because the fact is, is that Christ has already paid the penalty. This is why faith, the substance of things hoped or the evidence of things not seen, is the root strength of our hope. And when we have that, there is no devil, no demon that the devil can even send in order our way in order to negate or to remove us away from the love of God. This is why chapter 8 of Romans is so powerful. And I will tell you this. If there's any chapter in the Bible, in, in the entire book, in the entire 66 book collection, that you need to get in your spirit, it is Romans 8. And matter of fact, I would say Romans 7 and 8. Because what 7 does, 7 is an acknowledgement of our limitations. 7 is an acknowledgement. Chapter 7 is an acknowledgement of our limitations. But what Paul does... Paul flips it and says, but that's not the end of it. For we are more than conquerors through him that love us. So he wants us to understand we're limited, but we're not defeated. We're limited, but we already have victory. And also this, what this does, it procures for us an acknowledgement that our power doesn't come from us, but it must come from God consistently, constantly, continually. And this is why we, we go through the process of always each day praying. Thank you. Lord, forgive. If you want to read the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6. If you look at the stages of what's in that prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That's acknowledgement of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Acknowledgement to God and his creation. Give us this day our daily bread. Because this is all we have. It's right now. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Now, I did skip a part, I think, in the midst of that. But you see, forgiveness is tied in that because it must be an acknowledgement of our limitations. But your limitations don't mean that you're defeated. And see, that's what Satan's trying to trick you to do. Say, well, you're already in the flesh and you're already limited. And since you're already limited, hey, you're defeated. I've already got you. And all you need to do is point to the cross. No, no, Jesus has me because he defeated you. And I chose Christ. So how can I be defeated? I can't. I already have the victory. And that right there is a, the signature difference in our relationship. Again, we will suffer. That is a reality. That's a reality. Now, we, we don't see it as much. We see it probably internally. And I would say it's very somewhat light in, in this country. But there are people overseas. If they say they're a Christian, they'll catch a bullet. They could just as well die saying that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And that's a reality. And my mind really wasn't opened up to it until I went to the seminary with some folk who were missionaries and who had been shot and who had been stabbed and who had almost died because of their faith. I'm like, really? Yeah. I was in Africa, in a hut, just teaching the Bible. Guys come in, radical guys, radical Muslims specifically, came, came in, shot me, shot my, my buddy, shot, killed him, shot us with AK 47s. I should have died. But this is the reality of the persecution, part of the persecution, and it shows itself in many forms. But even in our context, it can show itself in so many different forms of, of persecution. No, why are you following Christ? Why are you becoming a Christian? Why are you even trying to follow this dirt poor carpenter from the ghettos in Nashville? I mean, you can go down the list of this. But, but persecute suffering is part of our journey. But don't allow suffering, don't allow the reality of that suffering to say, well, you know what? I don't want to deal with that, so I'm not going to follow Christ. We already have a victory. And we always have to hold on to that. So regardless of what may come, we're still victorious. Questions or comments before I get into the text, the scripture text today? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and read through this. Um, Romans 8, 18 through 30. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation that's here in our, in our commentary. It says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that day, that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Again, its will, uh, its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though, uh, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from, the, from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were, excuse me, we were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it, okay? But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and uh, comp uh, confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the, the Spirit is saying. When well, the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of them, of, the, uh, of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. 
Verse 30. And having chosen them, he called them to come, come to him. And having called them, he gave them a right, a right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. May it truly sanctify us to the deepest roots of our heart. So there is a freedom comes for creature and creation. Okay. The tie in here is gauged in when he says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed. Okay. So what, 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 when you hear this, what do you hear out of this? What I, what I hear is, regardless of what I'm going through, what God has for me because of me being, um, me being not only on his side, but trying to do it his way, tied to his salvation, that the glory that is promised of God that is promised to me later is much more exceeding than the suffering I'm dealing with now. That, that suffering when people come up against you, spirits come up against you, that's suffering because of the decay of our own bodies. As we age, as we get older, our bodies become weaker. That's part of being in the flesh. But the glory of God that we will be revealed later is much more than any suffering we'll, we will experience on this earth. And that promise right there is a lot, uh, especially the older saints, hold on to uh, fervently. And the reason why I believe they do is because they realize I trusted God long enough and regardless of how time goes by and how old I get in age, when this is all over, the glory that God will give me will far exceed any level of suffering I've had to deal with in the lifetime that he allowed me to have on this earth. And that to me is, is there, there's a gratification in that because what that does is it says that God has looked after me and there is a freedom that is tied tied even when I feel like I'm constrained. When I feel that because I'm a little older and I can't move as quickly or move as much as I used to, that the glory that will be revealed is much greater than where my present state or even any state I've dealt with in the past has ever been. And that to me is encouragement. It encourages me to go forward. One, one of the things I've gleaned from folks here at First and Outside, especially a lot of older members, is that they still push even in their limitations. And what I mean by that is that they're not going to allow their state, physical state, to dictate their spiritual well-being. But why just say something? <laughs> they're not going to let their physical state dictate their spiritual well-being. I watch Sister Maud bounce around here all the time. And I'm like, and it just amazes me. And I sit here and I just look at it and I'm like, this woman just has vigor. She, she just has just, just spiritual spunk, if you will. And, 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 and it's not to talk about your sister, Bob, but, but, what, I, what, I, but what I oftentimes see, and I'm using you as an example, is that I can see within that you're not going to allow your age, you're not going to allow your state of being, you're not going to allow your condition to go be to, 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 to overshadow the glory of God that the God has placed inside of you. And that should give people encouragement. When you see folks doing that, that should give you encouragement to say, wow, I need to get my faith level up to that place and up to that point. Because when I do that, God, I trust God. He's going to take care of me regardless of what may happen. And whatever suffering or hell I have to go through, that the glory of God is going to be revealed much later. And even on earth, he'll show it. it, it it's amazing to me. And see, and this is unconventional wisdom. This is the wisdom that's outside of human realm. Because when we begin to look at it God's way, what we'll find is, is that you'll understand what Nehemiah was saying. Well, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So if I have nothing else, and I, if I don't have much more scripture to lay on God, I trusted God long enough now. So regardless of what may happen, I still have God now, and I'm going to have him later. And the promises that he's still going to fulfill, even though I'm going through suffering. Questions, comments? Because this, this, 
This is something I think that helps to give us an empowerment, empowerment and encouragement and motivation that projects us forward and doesn't leave us in a downtrodden state. So when people ask you, how are you able to persevere and keep on moving? The grace of God. <laughs> the joy I still have in the Lord. It continues to move you. And that's real strength. That's real strength. One of the things that he, that he says here, for all creation is waiting eagerly for the future when God will reveal who his children are. Against his will, <clears throat> all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in pains of childbirth right up until the present time. And we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too want with eager, wait for eat with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, if we already have something, we don't need hope for it. But if we look forward to something we, we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. So when you hear that, what do you hear? There are certain things that we have possession of. But also there are other things that we don't have yet that God will reveal later. That's why I go back to verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. So we cannot let the sufferings of the present day cause us to feel that we're in a state of defeat but that we're victorious commentator writer uh, deals, deals with it this way and I'm going to deal with this question he says, in what ways have you seen creation itself suffering from the effects of sin have you, how have we seen that I, I'm asking generally if you want anyone wants to answer in regards to we've seen this in many different ways we see wars and rumors of wars. We're sitting in that right now in many respects. Not just Ukraine and Russia, but there's some other fighting that's going on that you haven't heard about. It's going on around the world. Um, disease and pestilence. We've been dealing with COVID for the last two years. Okay? It, it, is, that, is that part of just the aspect of sin? Could be, could not. I, I, again, I'm not going to sit there and point and say that sin. But I also believe there's some aspects that may be tied to that, of sin that are tied to some of the pestilences that we deal with, even on the earth. So with that, there is a future glory to be revealed, but we cannot bask ourselves in the pains of today, thinking that the pains of the day will leave us defeated. Okay? And, and I think that's one of the things that we have to, again, just keep in mind from, um, from that aspect. I was like, what did Kim? What does exactly means when uh, the Bible talks about the, the sins of Egypt are punished. Hmm. Let's talk about that. I didn't hear what, what you said. When I was talking, when uh, the Bible says uh, the sins of Egypt are punished. What, what does you know, the mean? What does it mean? Oh. So, so think, let's think. Let's think about. Let's think about Egypt from from the Old Testament perspective. Why did Moses go in? Why was he sent in by God? Okay, he was sent in to release the children of Israel. But what was going on in Egypt at that time? You had a lot of the worshiping of a lot of foreign gods. Okay. That, that's one piece of it. And all of these foreign gods were gods, quote unquote, I put in small g, were gods of various <laughs> things of creation. And when you actually look at the plagues themselves, each plague that God sent was against 
a particular God in Egypt. So if it was one, a God of fertility, a certain plague wiped that out. Literally, literally completely debunked it. Um, and I can get deeper into this. I just can't think of it all. Because we studied the book of Exodus. We talk about these. We talk about these things. Um, but literally when you see the sins of Egypt. It sins literally against creation. And so when we say sins against creation. These are things that are literally things that God has created. And there are other folks or other, other uh, entities that have tried to come up against it. Come up against it. And literally, that's when it says the sins of Egypt. So, again, taking God's creation out of the context upon which God's creation was established. And to be honest with you, Paul deals with this in the first chapter of Romans. And he really opens the book up with many, with some hard talk. I mean, I mean, he goes into the aspect of homosexuality. He goes into all that. And he hits, he hits it in his head because he says that they would rather worship the creation rather than the creator. So because of that tie-in, if you look at Egypt, much of what Egypt's sin was was literally sins against creation based off these gods, idols that they worship. But when you look at today, what do you see? You see a lot of worshiping of creation rather than worship of the creator. And that's done in many different forms. It can be done through materialism. It can be done through aspects of sexual morality. It can be done through aspects of um, how we don't treat our earth right. You know, you know that we litter, you know, and, and uh, we, we can't clean the ozone layer up and so forth. We're still letting things out and that are just uh, detrimental to human society, uh, to, to animals and plants and things of that nature. So it has a variety of meanings that are tied to it. And Paul deals with this, even in chapter 8. I don't know if that answers your question, but again, I just want to, I know I'm kind of been surfing in regards to that, but it's really the aspects of creation <clears throat> and sins against creation. And oftentimes, even our own, own uh, makeup of how God has made us there's a construct that he has set and established for our activities in life. Well, most people would think, well, you know, being promiscuous, you know, that's my freedom. No, it's not. Because there's an order that's set with that. There's an order that God has set with sexual activity. He set that. So again, it's a defilement of, of his intended order for creation. And I think that when, we, when you begin to see that, you know, consistently, it begins to really kind of usher in this aspect of, okay, how, how are, sometimes we, we, we suffer or we're suffering and going through spiritual warfare and we don't even know it because of the simple fact that if you're not in Christ, you're just doing it. You're just doing sin and, and that's part of, you feel like it's fine with me, it's okay, and so forth. You feel there's no repercussions for it. But sin is equated to death. So there is a spiritual dying, if you will, that comes in the aspect of sin. And there's no freedom there. There's no freedom from in, in that regard. Questions, comments? I know that first bell rang, that second one will be coming soon. So. Um, uh, let me ask you about uh, suffering, suffering from nothing we have done. Okay. But suffering from what our ancestors have done and we not having repented for what they have done. You know, therefore we suffer through the third and fourth generation out there because of the sins that our ancestors have done. I, I think this is something that, again, we see this in the Old Testament. We see this in the Old Testament a lot. One of the things we have to keep in mind when we, we talk about, you know, most people will, will refer to this generational curses and so forth with regards to that, is there's a warning that's oftentimes given, biblical, and you'll see it over and over in the book of Deuteronomy. It's, it goes on and on, and it says it consistently over and over and over again. 
Do not forget the Lord your God. Do not forget. Do not forget. Do not forget. And I think when you see the generational pieces, it's the question of either one adherence, non-adherence to what God's word has said when the warning has been given or an aspect of not knowing. And it's hard for me to go to that last piece because at some point, I believe that the glory of God and the majesty of God and the obedience toward God's word gets relayed in some way, shape, fashion, or form. And to not adhere to that is where you get the continuation of various things. So you can easily stop it, I believe, with just the adherence of what has been said. If we go through the process of saying that, okay, things keep going on, keep going on, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad, and we don't put the acknowledgement to what's going on, what's going on spiritually, then to me they will continue. They will. But you got to bring that to God. Now, we may not know what those sins of the past are. You know, we, historically we may not know. However, when there's things that continually go awry, This has to be placed before God. And, and, and God, I don't know what's going on, but we need release from this. And we need to adhere ourselves toward the word of God and to work toward God's will and his righteousness to begin that process of God. We want to get this ushered out. We give you, I'm, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to say I'm kind of crazy. So, past two weeks, uh, I had, I, had, I, had a, I had a chip on my windshield uh, on the car I had just purchased. Literally got it fixed. Safe light came out. The same day, another chip on the windshield. Same day. Within 12 hours, I immediately, I, I got home, I said, uh-uh. And it was almost in the same place. I said, Lord, I said, I think you're trying to tell me something. So, what I did, I stopped. And I went over the car to start praying. Just prayed over it. Just prayed over the car. Not necessarily that other damage or so what doesn't happen to it, but Lord, if you're trying to tell me something in regards to this, I'm just going to pray over it. And I didn't even think, I said, Lord, did I properly consecrate this gift you had given me when I got it? Because if I didn't, forgive me for that, but we're consecrating it now. So to me, there's an acknowledgement. It may not have been something I've done or didn't do, possibly. However, I do acknowledge God, if it was, forgive me for it. And cover me. Cover my family. Cover the things you bless me with. And if you don't wish for me to have certain things, that's fine too. That's fine. But I know, I know, if God has given a gift, have it covered. Have it covered. Have it covered. And it doesn't matter if it's a material thing, your family, anything. Cover. Why do we bless babies? We want God to cover them. There's a freedom there. There's a freedom there. Because cars can be totaled <laughs> easily. Possessions can be rusted out and be thought to be thrown away. But at the end of the day, Lord, make sure we're covered and make sure the things that matter in our lives, Lord, are covered. And we cover those things and also we live in obedience to God's word and his way and his will. The second bell rang. I want to read this question real quick. It says, when does the spirit... What does the Spirit do when our prayers do not align with God's will? <laughs> does the Spirit still intercess for us then? So, when we pray and something may not align with God's will, what does that say? What, 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 may, what may that say? It's God, God is going to have his will go forward. 
even when, even when what we're expecting may be against it, but you can guarantee it's for our better, it's, it's for our betterment. Because it may not look on the surface what we want it to look like. However, you can guarantee it's for our good later. Let me give you an example, biblically. Joseph did nothing wrong in Genesis. Nothing. A woman came on to him. She lied, told her husband Potiphar, had him thrown in a dungeon. He did nothing. Nothing. A cupbearer was in prison with him. He interpreted a dream. Cupbearer gets out. Cupbearer forgets him. After Joseph said, please remember me. Tell somebody about me and my plight. But it's amazing what happens is that he's at the dungeon, in the dungeon. That's underneath the jail. <laughs> That's underneath the jail. He ends up, the cupbearer is in the king's court, in Pharaoh's court. Pharaoh's got a dream he can't interpret. Having nightmares about it, cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph. And within a 24-hour span, Joseph is elevated from the dungeon, from the dungeon, to being second in command of all of Egypt. Wow. In a matter of a day. If his brothers would have known selling him into slavery was going to lead him to being second in command of Egypt, they wouldn't have done it. They wouldn't have done it. This is why we never know the anticipation of God's will in the end, but we must trust that God's will is what it is and it's for our good. This is why 8 and 28 is so important of Romans. For all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That's why that's important. And we have to keep that in mind. Even when it doesn't look like God is interceding on our behalf, he actually is. He actually is. And we just have to trust in faith that he's doing so, even when it doesn't look like it. Even when it doesn't look like it. Wow. That second bell rang. I had one more question I want to ask. How has God called you throughout your life? How has God called you throughout your life? And I think in various stages, all of us can answer that question differently, but in different stages, God has called us to do various things. And the connection that is tied there for us, I believe, is what really, and forgive me, I, I lost, lost my place. Here we are. So it's tied to what I believe is tied into that verse that I just read in, in, in uh, Romans 8 and 28. And we know that all things work together, together for the good of them that love the Lord and call according to his purpose. Verse 29, but God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him and having called them, he gave them the right standing with himself and having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. That shows an order of progression. That's what it really does. To the point of God's glory and a freedom to hope. Truly a freedom to hope. 8 and 28 is kind of that hinge pinch verse. All things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Even when it seems bad, even when it seems like it doesn't make any sense. When you're ready to say, God, why are you forsaking me? You can rest assured that it's for your good. It's for your good. I, I'm sorry, Sister D, I can't hear you. You can, you, can be, you can be rest assured that it's for your good. Yeah, you can be rest assured that it's for your good. Even when it doesn't seem like it. And that's what the Christians, that's what we deal with when we deal with difficulties. We're like, the first thing we're like, God, where are you? Where, where are you in this? I don't know where you are. Because it doesn't feel like 
your love. It doesn't feel like God is in operation, but he is. And you may, and the glory might not be revealed then, but you can guarantee it, it will be revealed later. And what you'll realize is that that glory that you, that was revealed unto you later was greater than any suffering that you experienced. Mm. Boy, that's, that's, that's the part that gets me because if we can believe that, then we go back to verse 18. These momentary struggles are nothing to be compared to the glory that would be revealed. That, that is a trust factor. And when it hurts to the deepest core, whatever it may be, diagnosis, bereavement, all of that, that at some point we are trusting God, that God, the pain I'm experiencing now, I pray, Lord, that you will show me the greater joy after this is over. Because we're trusting God for it. But also, remember, that's a freedom. Even in our hurt, there's a freedom for the future that is tied to the suffering we deal with. That's how I feel about the job. Yeah. Hmm. I suffer. I suffer. But I know one day, in the end, there's going to be some glory. Hmm. You know, it may take me leaving or whatever, but uh, I know glory's coming. And, and again, it's. It, it, I think it, it goes through the process, Brother Kenny, that what God has for you, he has for you. And, and, and also that God will have us in seasons of places and, and, and so forth. And this is why it's so important to realize God's great glory. Even though you don't know what that may be, but I can guarantee you it's better than the anguish that you may be feeling even now or even, even later. That that glory to be revealed is much greater. Um, this is why I oftentimes say that kingdom of God is, is now but not yet. Most people saw, focus on heaven. And, and I, I tell people, before, you, before we get there, experience God's glory now. Be, be able to experience that now because it's going to bring you joy and happiness even in a place that could be conflict. And you have, as a matter of fact, you're more freer than most people when you're able to look at it that way and see it that way and operate in it that way. So, that's it, y'all. I'm over my time. Well over my time. Um, I'm going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to be dismissed on today in regards. I pray that the lesson, again, bless everyone, um, everyone who's watching online and so forth. Uh, we are going to be in 10 o'clock worship very shortly, so please bear with us. We'll be back again for our worship on today. Sister Reeves. Uh, I just have, I'm not going to take long, I just have a short uh, testimony. Yes. I uh, I've been, by, uh, I went to the doctor, and the doctor told me that I had uh, Parkinson's. He said, well, you might have Parkinson's. So he gave me a biopsy, and uh, I waited and waited. And I, all while I was waiting, I was thanking God. I was thanking him for just letting me be able to afford to go to the doctor mm -hmm. and see, you know, what was going on with my body. And uh, Tuesday, I went back to the doctor, and he told me, because they had took a biopsy, and told me that the biopsy said that I, I didn't have problems. Amen. I don't know, I still don't know what the doctor said after that job, but I'm going to have to go back and talk to him, but I was so happy. I was so, I was thank you. Amen. 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 I thank whoever I told, and they prayed for me, and if they didn't, I still thank God. And and, and, and and we just thank God, Sister Reeves, again for God's just glory being revealed in, in that mission and showing his, his greater glory. And, and what you just said in your testimony lines up in this lesson. Suffering toward what greater glory? Toward greater glory. And I would spin it off this way. That even if that prognosis was negative, God would still have you covered. 
God will still have you covered. And this, this is why I'm, I'm learning more and more the connection between my faith and my circumstances. That my circumstances can never overweigh or overshadow my faith. So now this starts to come to mind when I, when I have talked to folks on their bedside and I, and I know and they know that God is about to call them home. That if this is God's will, so be it. But these momentary struggles are nothing to be compared to the glory that will be revealed. And that's an expectancy. And that's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us moving. And that's what keeps us in faith with God and with he, what he has already orchestrated. Say some old, say it, said it this way. You don't have to go into theological epitaphs and all this other stuff in order to do it. I'm going to keep running and see what the end's going to be. I'm going to keep on running because he ain't failed me yet. And since he has a track record of not failing, I still trust that he's not. He's not going to fail. So I'll trust. Just to get it. Somebody, somebody had a hand up. It, it, it may not be the time to bring it out, but this is this is not for me. You're getting ready to pray. I am. I, I, I need it. If, if you don't mind, uh, brother, uh, brother Hanson, if you just put my clothes, just closing the door. And we no, we're about to, we're about to pray uh, to end the end. I just want to make sure we know other comments and so forth. But no, that's fine. I end up out of respect. All right. So with that said, we're going to have a word of prayer uh, before we move out of Sunday school and, of course, into service. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for today. And thank you, Lord, for this lesson uh, that we have heard, oh Lord, on today. Thank you, Lord, for uh, co contributions for everyone in the class. Freedom for the future. That, Lord, freedom for the future, Lord, doesn't mean that we're constrained by the past. That we're victorious, Lord, because we have your salvation and cause we have that God, the expectancy of your glory, oh God, through suffering. Suffering that we experience, Lord, is not greater than the glory that you will reveal. Thank you for all that you continue to do in our lives. Connect us, keep us connected, God, to your word and to your way. And we'll be careful to continue to give your name, praise, honor, and glory. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.